welcome. If you're in Detroit, it would be 89 about the next July. So, rather unique to live in California. Hey, thanks for being here, and we are, we are in for it tonight because we've had some amazing people contributing, and Laura Savitz has contributed cookies tonight. Um, Donna's were great last week, so we're blessed. Thanks for uh, the offerings for uh, Life on the Hill were great. You uh, gave $574, which is really good. Yeah, it's really good. We might do it one more time in January, but that's awesome. Um, so let's begin. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this day you've made. Thank you that time is in your hand. Thank you that you are the beginning and the end. Thank you that all of that you purpose will happen. And Lord, um, one, we thank you for Jesus, and we want to look at him closely tonight, and how complete is his righteousness, how secure we are, covered by his blood, um, standing before you, holding righteous because of him, all because you, you gave your son for us, so that we would not need to stand on our own before you, but we might stand in him. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage all of us, and if anyone's here or listening that has not yet taken that stand, that uh, this would be the fruit of what you're doing. Open our eyes to your word, uh, bring understanding, bring clarity, uh, and continue to build our understanding of what is happening and what is soon to happen. Um, we, we pray also that you would, Lord Jesus, come soon, but Lord, that you would bring in a harvest. You would bring in a harvest. And we pray for family as Thanksgiving and Christmas come that don't know you, that you would give us opportunity to give the reason for the hope that we have and open eyes to you. We thank you. We love you. We do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been uh, trying to strategize how to do all the questions because it's got some good questions. And I uh, want to do, my, my goal is when we're in those areas to, um, uh, to open understanding to those and in, incorporate those. But I will get to uh, them all. Let's go over to Revelation 4. Uh, we have been, um, last week we were introduced, we've been through the big transition in time, uh, right now in the age of the gospel, um, the gospel going out to the ends of the earth, uh, and then Jesus comes, takes his church home, and then um, beginning after that is the seven year period of time, which Revelation 4, 1, John who's been on earth, he said, come up. Uh, and I will show you what take, must take place um, after this. And so Revelation 4 to 19, remember, is one seven-year period of time, uh, divided three and a half years, three and a half years, 1,260 days, 1,260 days. Uh, same time period from beginning to end. It's done in chronologically. But what happens is he gives the span and then goes back and brings detail and then the span to the end. And then Revelation 20 begins 1,000 years when Jesus comes back brings his kingdom to earth, and uh, then Satan is bound uh, for a thousand years. Jesus rules the nations, and they know what they could have had. And then at the end of that, uh, Satan is loosed. Everyone rebels again. Uh, short battle, and then comes the final resurrection for the wicked, in which everyone will stand on Judgment Day. And then the creation of a new heaven uh, and the new earth. Um, so as... Um, John is being cut up. He's cut up to see the Father uh, seated on the throne. And Revelation gives us this staggering picture uh, into God, the magnitude of him, the magnificence of him. And uh, tonight we want to also go into uh, Jesus as well. But let's go back over to um, chapter 4, verse, verse 11. Let's just kind of pick up again, uh, make sure we're understanding fully all of what's saying here. So it's revealing God on the throne, it's revealing the four creatures, uh, representing uh, each part of God's creative being, man, uh, lions, ox, and uh, the eagle, representing uh, mankind, representing wild animals, rep representing domesticated, uh, representing uh, birds, all there, magnifying God, so uh, his delight uh, in his creation. As we look at um, well, let's go back to verse 8. As we look at how God is called, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Now, that's, that's a language technique um, 
in Hebrew, if you want to take something to the ultimate, uh, you take it to the third. And um, Jesus would do that with truth. He would, the old King James caught it up better, but he used to do it twice. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you. So um, everything he said was true, but this was what is important. But when it's taken to the third degree, it's taken to the ultimate. And uh, that's who God is. And what is emphasized about him is that uh, he is holy. And holy means cut off from all else. So God is wholly separate from all that he created, from all other beings. Um, and he's also separate from, um, from evil, uh, from any evil. So he is holy. Uh, also something holy, then, is something totally set apart for him and um, belonging to him and for his use only. So he is holy, holy, holy. That is said day and night. And we're going to get into... Revelation, we're going to see the staggering things that are going to be happening on earth, but we're going to be caught up into heaven and see uh, how the angelic world says, you are holy, it is right for you to judge, they have been rebellious, it is right, you are holy, um, and it is just for you to do that. When we think of God's mercy and grace, it's an aspect of his holiness. Uh, but the Bible doesn't say God is love, love, love. Uh, he is. I mean, he's loving and, and he's not separated from that. But the root uh, of his identity is that he's holy. And ho love is an aspect of that, um, as well as mercy and grace and unchanging and all the rest of that. But uh, that he is, is holy. And again, that's um, understanding then that, that leads us with this great peril, which is how can I come to a holy God, and how can I be accepted by a holy God, and that's what uh, we're going to see in Jesus in, in a moment. Now, when we get to the end of Revelation 4, it says why God should be worshipped. Uh, why, why is he worshipped? And we, we notice in uh, verse 11, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So that God is worthy to be worshipped in all honor and glory uh, and power because he created all things and by his will they exist. And so this understanding of God as creator is incredibly important uh, for us uh, in understanding uh, how God is to receive glory and honor. And um, he spoke things into existence. Uh, he brought them about not in some... Um, Explosion that happened over time, but with purpose and intent um, throughout, um, so that he brought things into being. Now, there are two words used with, um, in Genesis 1 with the heavens and the earth. Uh, it says, in the beginning, God created. And then a little bit later, it uh, talks about God made. Um, so created is very important because uh, it, it means out of nothing. Uh, the Latin words that used for creation are ex nihilo, out of nothing. Uh, so he didn't work with what was. He brought it into being. Uh, so uh, out of nothing, he spoke it into existence. Um, and then from what he created, then he did make uh, parts uh, shape it and, and the rest of it. But very important for us to understand out of, out of nothing. Um, it wasn't that energy is is eternally existing and always changing in form. There isn't any energy without God. He has is, he is, he is created all things out of nothing. Um, and then he worked it and, and makes it, um, but he created out of nothing. Now, when we come to uh, that concept, it also has tremendous amount to do with our salvation as well. Uh, just keep a finger or taking your phone out over to 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, verse 17, and that's understanding what Jesus has done for me uh, and for us who are a part of uh, his family. Uh, it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, okay? Uh, the old has passed away. Behold, a new has come. So it isn't that Jesus comes to make us a better me, uh, and improve me. 
He's come to make out of nothing. <laughs> Uh, so I am wholly uh, still me, but I am born this new creation, um, not an improved person, but made in the likeness uh, by God, made as this new person in Christ. And uh, now I'm still living in a, a, a body and still living with sin within me and all the rest of that, but I am this new creation. And uh, so I'm, I'm not trying to improve. I'm trying to live out this new reality, this new power, this new person I am um, and by the resources that I have. And, you know, as David said in Psalm 16, there is no good thing that dwells in us. So he's not making us better. If anyone is Christ, he's a new creation, uh, totally the work of, of God. Uh, the old has passed away. It's still there, but no longer is that me. And so that's very important when I go back to understanding who I am. Uh, it's my identity in Christ that defines who I am because sin is still there and my old self is still there. But I can make choices because I am this new creation um, uh, having that. And so uh, when you come back, let's go back to Revelation 4. When we deal with this reality of God making something out of nothing and bringing into existence what wasn't, um, that's happened with us. That's happened with us. And uh, we're in this process then uh, of being uh, made into the likeness of Christ as we lay hold of that. That's why Colossians and, uh, says, um, you know, put off the old man, put on the new. Well, that isn't, that isn't an improvement program. That is getting better. That's laying hold of this new creative power, life that I have in Jesus Christ uh, and to bring glory to him. And that is an improved person. That is a better person. That is a person who got a second, third chance, fourth chance. But I am this now this new creation in Christ Jesus by, by his work indwelled by the Holy Spirit, um, able now to live out what I was purposed for so that my life as uh, all of his creation's purpose uh, verse 11 is bringing glory and honor uh, back in Revelation 4, glory and honor and power to God uh, through who I am as this new creation. Uh, Paul said in talking about his own ministry, uh, he said, I'm not adequate to consider anything that's coming from me. My adequacy comes from uh, the Holy Spirit who makes me adequate for what God is doing in life. So we're laying hold of this new creation now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, directed by the word on uh, that person. So Revelation 4 ends with God being received worship, which you see why it is so clever for Satan to imagine a world without a creator. Because he hates God and the whole purpose of creation and realizing if there is a creator, then I'm responsible to him. I'm to bring what this says, glory, honor, and power. Uh, but this cleverness of trying to explain what is uh, uh, without needing God to do it is, I think, Satan's clever strategy because uh, his purpose is to uh, deny God the glory and honor and power that he's due. Now, as we get over to Revelation 5, there is uh, in the hand of God uh, a scroll, and we've done this before, but uh, it's just a scroll long, written on both sides, uh, that is sealed uh, into seven sections. And that's God's plan for uh, bringing an end to sin, uh, bringing in righteousness, uh, bringing in uh, the everlasting kingdom. So that, that's in his hand. Uh, and so as John is there, there's this question raised, well, who is worthy to bring in what God's plan is? And so let's, let's pick it up in Revelation 5.1. Then I saw on the right hand of him, and again, I'm sorry for you left-handed people, but we got a spirit, so it's just using a way for us to understand. Uh, then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one on heaven and on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Why? No one is worthy. Uh, not an angel, not a, uh, any other person 
uh, why? Why can, why can no one do that? What, what is the problem? What is the issue? And John's dealing with that. Um, so he says in verse 3, no one in heaven and earth is, or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. I even look into it. And begin to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So Jesus has the right to, um, to bring in this because he has been to the cross and conquered. Uh, it, it's, it's realizing that God can't save us as God. Okay, Because all God can do is, is judge us. Because he is holy. And the law has said, as God has put it into us, the soul that sins must die. It says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. It says that sin separates us from God. Um, so God could, God could not save us as God. Nothing he could do because he is holy and just, and he must uh, uphold that holiness and righteousness, and we are all guilty. Uh, so it leaves us this tremendous uh, problem as to, uh, and, uh, as to how we can be saved. And the only way it could happen is if Jesus, the God the Son, would become man. He could only save us by what he did as man. He never stopped being God. But God couldn't save us because he is holy and just. He could only judge us. God couldn't say, okay, I'll let her go. Uh, all right, you know, I'll, I'll let you, let you into eternity. Um, I'll just forget all that, or you've been generally, generally repentant or whatever. He, he couldn't do that. Um, and so Jesus had to become man and go to the cross, one, live a life of innocence so that he is the only one who ever lived who did not deserve judgment himself. There's no one righteous, no, not one. No one understands. Romans 3 says that uh, as well. And so... Um, Jesus came and he fulfilled what God required, what the law required. He lived perfectly, loved the Father with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he perfectly loved us and, and others so that he could become a substitute for us uh, in, in, in judgment uh, so that the wrath that we deserve could be put on someone else. Uh, and that would give him the right to redeem people from the judgment we're all under. So the only way he could redeem anybody, the only way he could save anybody, the only way he could keep anybody from going to hell is that if he would pay the price for their uh, sin, that they could um, have that substitute. And that's why the Bible uses uh, a lot the idea of debts, kind of a financial picture of uh, sin is, uh, wages of our sin is death. Uh, and so there's a payment that has to be made uh, for uh, us to not to escape the judgment that, that is there. Um, so uh, as it's there, but, you know, it's like the court system today. If, if, you know, suppose I had a bad day. I was on the freeway today from Palm Springs. Suppose I had a bad day and I got a big traffic ticket. And I came to you and said, you know, I'm coming to help you. Couldn't someone help with this ticket? See, the court wouldn't care who paid it. Court would not care who paid it. You could, uh, you could pay it. I haven't, so you don't need to worry about where he's going with this. <laughs> All that would need to be done is that it's paid in my name. Now, that's how God has created his justice system, is that... It must be paid, but God allows for someone else to pay that uh, in it. That's the why when the first thing we see this is with Abraham. Um, and it says Abraham was counted righteous. Well, that's a counting term. That's an accounting term. That's written in the, in the book about uh, uh, Abraham, that he is righteous. That, that's in his account. Um, and so as we come to uh, the revelation of Jesus, and let's read it starting in verse 6. It's, it's why, how he is able to um, 
why he, he is able to redeem and why he's able to bring in uh, the f plan of God, which without Jesus would be all of us go to hell. And that would be just. But God in his mercy, God so loved us, he sent his son for us. And so, um, and it says there in uh, verse 5 that Jesus uh, is the one and his identity, a lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, that was, he was born, and when Jacob uh, was talking about each of the tribes and the blessings, Judah uh, was the, the lion, uh, he's the root of David. Uh, the everlasting kingdom, there will be someone come one day, David, who in your line will be bring in uh, an everlasting kingdom. And so his identity uh, as um, Jewish Judah, the line of David, he's conquered. Uh, so he can open the scroll. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. With, excuse me, seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Imagine our prayers stored up before God. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you've made them a kingdom uh, and priests to our God, uh, and they shall reign on the earth. So Jesus came to take our place in our judgment, uh, and it was uh, upon him. He was slain uh, so that by his blood, by what he has shed, uh, he might ransom people. Now, ransom is... Uh, someone who's held for, uh, uh, you know, for money to release. So something is paid uh, so that they are ransomed, they are uh, redeemed. And Jesus' blood has um, ransomed us uh, from people, from every tri tribe, um, language, people, and nation. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, you know, well, Jesus' death on the cross could be enough because he was God. That's wrong. <laughs> It, it, his death was for us because he was man, because he was our substitute. And there's a couple of pictures of that. You who have been through Romans and disciples have uh, come over to Romans 5, where um, Adam and then Jesus is the second Adam. Uh, and that there is this sense in which um, this head of mankind was Adam. He represented all of us, and he fell, so the curse came to all of us. And then Jesus came as the second Adam, uh, and um, he was righteous, and through the cross, he, he earned a righteous for us. So uh, in that sense that he represents us, we stand now in him, um, in his race of people uh, redeemed from the cross. We stand under his blood, and we saw the picture of the Passover, because uh, he died as the Passover lamb. And when the, uh, Moses was told, Death is coming to every house in Egypt, every house, uh, except those who are covered by uh, the blood of the lamb. So you were to take a lamb into your house, um, three days, I think, for the week, uh, and then uh, you are to um, take its life, collect its blood, <clears throat> put it on your doorpost, uh, and then um, eat the lamb and, and be ready. And the, when the angel came uh, to each house, all he was looking for was the blood. Not are they Egyptian, are they Israeli, are they doing okay? Or all they received, if they saw the blood, that's all he saw, he passed over. And that's what Jesus is for us. That God can't, what God sees is the blood of Jesus. We stand uh, under him. Uh, and so that uh, he, sees his, he sees his blood and it is enough. It is enough because sin is paid for. Uh, the curse has been taken uh, upon Jesus on the cross that he might ransom a people for himself. So when I stand in Jesus, it would be unjust of God to demand more in punishment. Because it would be saying, my son wasn't enough. You know, this whole idea of purgatory is just, um, it's just well, it, 
insulting is a mild word, but it's saying the blood of Jesus isn't enough. You have to add to that. Or if you had some things that you've done afterwards that didn't measure up, then you've got to pay for that. And it's, you know, it's this combination. And um, it is just um, saying that the blood of Jesus is not enough. Um, and it is. And that's what it's saying uh, in Revelation 5, that he has ransomed us. Uh, and he has, uh, verse 10, and notice it's something that's already happened. He has made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So not only has he redeemed us and made us this new creation, he's made us royalty. Um, we are one of the royals of God. Uh, and uh, he's made us priests. Priests are those who have the right to come right into the presence of God uh, on behalf of people. And a priest also represented God to people. So that both ways um, uh, there. And we are that now. Okay? We are this new creation. Uh, already made new in Christ Jesus, uh, complete in him, in the process of becoming that holiness uh, as we, uh, that new covenant is worked work out with us. But even that isn't, uh, we aren't getting improved. <laughs> you know, I think this whole process of maturing in Christ is a process of increasing weakness. It is. Because what you do is you realize how much I need him in this. I don't get stronger. I don't get better. It's only him. But what I've learned is how this works. And that uh, I don't try this in my own anymore. I'm asking Jesus to do that. And it's always him. So, but he, it's always he's the dynamic. It's never us. It's never works. Um, and all of us have that fullness and that opportunity. And so, um, but he has redeemed a people for himself, uh, and already accomplished. Now, let's see this scene uh, over in Daniel. So turn it over to Daniel chapter 7, and we'll see that what Daniel foresaw of this with God on the throne, uh, with uh, the scroll in his hand, God seated on the throne. Uh, what Daniel is portraying is while this is going on, on earth, the Antichrist is there blaspheming God, uh, um, creating his rebellion against God, and uh, all of this is happening while God is seated on the throne. So over to Daniel 7, uh, 9, and I, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and as the hair of his head like pure wool. The throne, his throne were fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousands, thousands served him. Ten thousands times ten thousand. That's a hundred million. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. So there's the father on the throne, ancient of days. A hundred million angels gathered around um, just a portion of those created beings. And then I, I looked, he said in 11, behold, the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Remember, the horn is the king, the ruler, uh, the Antichrist. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominions was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came, like, came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom and all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall be destroyed. And so here's Daniel foreshadowing what we're seeing in Revelation 5 of God on the throne uh, and one like the son of man. And that was... As we've said before, that was um, in verse 3, 13, I mean, when like a son of man, that was Jesus' favorite title for himself. Um, again and again, he used himself. You go to the Gospel of John, the son of man, the son of man, uh, in there. And that's why they were ready to kill him, because they knew what he was referring to uh, as this one who had the right to, to take the kingdom. But he had that right, not as God. He had that right because... He had redeemed us through what he had done um, as um, God who became man. He never stopped being God. But he gained the right 
to save us by the fact that he as man paid for us on the cross uh, and took that upon himself uh, and has earned, been given by the Father judgment over all peoples for he is the uh, one who will bring in uh, the final judgment. So uh, we see again the parallels between Revelation and Daniel, uh, the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament uh, perfectly uh, in sync uh, that is there. Now it's interesting, if you go back to Revelation 5, this magnificence of Jesus. Now, uh, and it says, and I look and I heard around the throne, uh, five, Revelation 5, 11, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, were these lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing? And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worship. Now it's interesting, there's a difference between um, what God is to receive in Jesus. Uh, in 11, over in chapter four, verse 11, we receive that he has received glory and honor and power we come over to uh, Jesus in verse 12. He's received power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory uh, and, and blessings. Uh, all of the resources of this world uh, are now his, and the power uh, is now his. And he has been given by the Father the inheritance of all things. So all of it belongs to him. Thus, it's worthy for us to bring um, him our honor, our wealth, um, he is wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. For the Father has put his Son, uh, elevated him up uh, above all. Interesting that those who are under the earth uh, are also um, bringing praise to him because, as Philippians says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. Some in love and devotion, some um, in fear and terror of him before him and uh, compelled by uh, who he is and who they are in that. But all will bow to him uh, before him uh, and bring him praise and honor. And so uh, what, what he now has is this scroll and he's going to uh, unfold it and each section will be uh, received by, by John and described for us as it comes. But it's all what's written there. Um, and it's accomplishing what he had said would happen in the 70 weeks uh, in Daniel 9. Should we go back? You got it. You're easy with the Bible. So let's go back to Daniel 9 again. Let's just remember uh, all of what he's going to accomplish that Revelation is describing. Uh, over in uh, Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks or 490 years are decreed about your people and your holy city. Now, here's all the things going to have. The holy city is Jerusalem, Jewish people. Uh, that to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. So those are all of what Revelation is describing how they will happen uh, and how this will be fulfilled. Uh, and we know that there were 69 years in continuity, contiguous to one another, uh, and then the cross, he was cut off. Um, for this indefinite period of time, which is when the gospel is, the age of grace. And then as we get to verse 27, one last seven-year period, one last um, week in which all of this will be accomplished because it ends with Jesus coming to earth, um, uh, Satan bound and cast into hell, locked into hell, and the kingdom coming to earth. Uh, so again, we see these are hand in hand uh, with each other. Now let's go back to uh, Revelation 5 again and um, the, the magnitude of the magnificence of this. Now, how is it, let's be sure we understand verse 10, how is it that we become kingdom and priests? How is it that I am sure that I'm part of this? Um, what, what more important question could there be that I'm part of this? Well, let's, let's move ahead and, and anticipate for a moment over to Revelation 12 and let's just see how, what how it is that uh, we are part of this uh, and standing there. 
Uh, Revelation 12.10, Satan is being thrown out of heaven. Uh, there are more pictures of that happening. But verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God, and they have conquered him. Now notice how. They've conquered him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and for they love their lives uh, even unto death. Um, so how is it that they are there? How is it that we overcome? How is it that we're part of that family? Um, we stand in the blood of the Lamb. We put our trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for our forgiveness of our sins, for our acceptance from God. But our commitment for Jesus is real. Uh, and as it says um, there in verse 11, uh, by the word of their testimony, they, they were witnesses for him. They stood for Jesus. Um, they were living out their love and honor of him. And there was nothing that would ever lead them to give him up, not even death, uh, as um, that's there. So whatever it costs to follow Jesus, they are willing to pay. And it is those three working together, uh, the blood of the lamb, our uh, desire to stand for him, um, and there's no, nothing that would ever let us, cause us to uh, give him up, is what is the evidence there uh, of that saving work uh, of Jesus in us that's made us kingdom uh, in priest. Now, no one does this perfectly, okay? Uh, but over time, it will evidence itself of our identity with Jesus, our willingness to walk with him. And we'll never give them up. When we get into Revelation 6, um, when we think about, when we talk about the fifth seal, which is martyrdom, do you know that there will be, uh, in 2019, 100,000 people this year put to death for Jesus? There have been, in the 21st century already, there have been a million people put to death for their faith in Jesus. You know, uh, there's a, a group that advocates for the persecuted church that put that statistic out. And so the BBC, uh, the British Broadcasting Network, the big news uh, organ there, said, well, that, well we're going to find out if that's true or not. Uh, 100,000? And um, they, they have said that is true. We are in that age of hundreds of 100,000 people this year uh, who will be put to death for their faith in Christ. Uh, they just had our election in Sri, Sri Lanka, which uh, was part of what was behind that was this last Easter when they bombed churches and uh, what was it, over 250 uh, were, were, were killed and all, all, all over this world it's happening. So people that are willing to stand for Jesus no matter what it costs, uh, no matter... Uh, what it means. Uh, so they they stand in the blood. They stand um, willing to confess him. Um, they won't give him up no matter what. Um, and that is what, uh, what is the quality of those who are there. They're saved by faith. They're trust in him, but our faith uh, is real and it, and it works out in time. So there is... The Father, there is Jesus and the magnificence of him um, who has won the right for us because he became man and he willingly, no one took his life, he laid it down, he willingly took our place uh, so that the, the wrath that we deserve because the soul that sins must die. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And he is the one who has done that um, and he has paid in full, and whoever stands in him, uh, no matter what sins they're in, uh, have been in, there is this total forgiveness, uh, this total stand, and that's how we stay in him as we continue to lay hold of uh, the blood of Jesus and him, and by that blood to conquer. Um, so let's move on now to the, to the, the seals. Uh, just, just two questions. I, I see roses here. I want to handle two that came. One was this whole idea of anti-Semitism. And why is Russia, why is Russia known uh, throughout its history as anti-Semitic? 
Well, the reality is, all of that comes from Satan. Satan hates the Jews because they are the chosen people of God. Uh, and uh, salvation is of the Jews, and he knows that um, the final plan is him bringing back the Jewish people to Israel. There, so it's it's this wor work of Satan. But every society uh, has anti-Semitism in it, um, including America. Uh, I was uh, listened uh, Sunday night, uh, Saturday night, maybe it was. They had a Special HBO had done a study of all of Lincoln's words, all he said, his tapes are out now. Uh, and um, what he said about the Jewish people was just shockingly evil. Just shockingly evil. Uh, so uh, America knew Jewish people were being killed in the Holocaust in World War II. We were silent when they were wanting to places where they could go to be refugees. America didn't open their doors, uh, or did Britain, or, or the rest. Uh, so uh, it's part of wherever uh, society is, but there are some places where it, uh, it arouses in, in force and power, obviously with Germany, with Hitler. Uh, a lot of it still going on now. Russia has been one of those places that over time has just um, had this violent at times, attack on Jewish people, uh, and the blaming for everything, conspirators, and uh, so um, they're just one of those nations that most acted it out. But anti-Semitism is um, part everywhere uh, that, that's around us. So uh, it's there. It's there now happening on liberal college campuses um, because now the Palestinians are the Hebrews and. Jews are the evil ones, and um, so, uh, so anti-Semitism is evident. It's in uh, uh, American ultra-right groups. Um, it's, uh, it's part of this world because it's Satan. Um, he's working, he's the god of this culture, uh, and, is, and, and is working to do that. So, but Russia is one of those that was most known for that, which is why when the Soviet Union collapsed um, that in the 1990s, there were a million people that immigrated from the former Soviet Union to Israel, because there is no safe place for them in Russia. Um, you know, that's, that's the whole, we were, just, we were just talking with the mic before the class tonight, that's, you know, that's the whole mentality of, of Israel, is that um, the Jewish people have realized, sooner or later, every country will turn on us. So if we don't have a homeland that's ours, we will be eliminated. Um, so when, when Israel is dealing with foreign policy, they're dealing with survival. If we don't defend ourselves, uh, and they're, they're kind of the whole idea of what's behind military officers and the rest is this saying in Israel, never again. Never again will we uh, not fight. Were we ever allowed to be taken? We may be overcome, but we will never again not fight. And uh, the great picture they use as, uh, as Masada, where the last of uh, the rebels, uh, Jewish independent ones, who had, um, after Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, had fled to Masada. Uh, there in this, I'm not sure how high it is, um, the long cable car, I know that much. <laughs> Uh, over, over the desert, there was uh, Herod had built out. He was paranoid, uh, so he built these number of evacuation places where he could go if things went bad. You know, they don't think he ever was at Masada, but it was just amazing. And it was where the last ones were there. Uh, and um, Rome eventually built up the ramparts to be able to come and overtake him. Uh, so they made a pledge that it would be better to die than to live as slaves. And uh, one. One was left to bring a witness to this. And uh, they took the children and then the wives and then uh, their, uh, each of their own lives. And uh, so that when it came, Israeli military officers are taken to Masada. And what was written there, you can find it online, it's amazing. 
uh, it was written there by them. They all make that, that pledge. Um, better to die than once again be in subjection uh, to those. And so uh, that, that issue is there. Also, there's a question on the United States. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit later when we get over to Revelation 18. But has the, has the U.S. always been evil? And um, we have to realize about nations. Nations aren't saved or lost. People are. Okay? So uh, when America was formed, there were many strong Christians part of this and many godly principles that uh, our governments were, were stand upon. Many who said, we need a country where Jesus can be freely proclaimed without government influ interference. Uh, and they got through there. So they, they were part of this. Uh, they were part of that. But um, also there was those who were of the Freemasons who also had uh, another idea of creating a new world order, um, this country being key in bringing a new world order to there. So that was also part of it. America has uh, always been compromised in who it is. Um, you know, our, our history was slavery. Uh, our history, uh, here we had a declaration of, of independence where all people who are created by God with certain inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, uh, in the pursuit of happiness. And yet we were able to have a category of people in the South who were uh, property, uh, who had no rights, who could be bought or sold. So we've always been in this tension between what is good uh, and what is not, what we did to indigenous Americans. Uh, as we went west, and the story of what has happened there is, is horrible, it's evil. Um, that we, um, you know, brought in a whole bunch of Chinese people to build a railroad and treated them. So it's always been mixed. It's always been uh, this uh, conflict be, uh, between uh, those, you know, what is good and what is right and what it isn't. So uh, it is that now... Um, there is a shock to this. When we get to Revelation 18, there's kind of a shock. Babylon has fallen. The United States has fallen. The United States has become a dwelling place for people. So there's this, there's this shock to it because we've also been much, brought much blessing. Um, when American servicemen came back from World War II um, and saw a world without Christ, the great modern missionary movement was birthed. Uh, with those who came back with uh, uh, visions. And, you know, they were in uh, Indonesia, and they realized there are hundreds of thousands of people living up uh, in the highlands there that never have been contacted. And uh, the whole inland. So this great movement came back. And America was, American missionaries were in the end of the 40s, 50s, 60s. We were the ones that were used of God to bring the gospel to the world. Uh, we've never been about conquering people, um, just leave us alone, let us have our money and leave us alone. Uh, we don't want to conquer you. So, uh, you know, there's, we're, so there's been good and not. It's always been this mix. Um, and it was at the beginning. It's just that now, uh, at, at the end, it's, it's money and immorality, it's sex and immorality, but it's one over everything else. Um, and defines it. We'll get to that. Uh, later, but there was much that you can look at that was good. Many who were um, brave, uh, many who uh, had this vision of, uh, of God. But you know, even the establishment of uh, our rebellion from England, uh, because uh, England has uh, the right of kings to rule, and um, so we were under the king. But we didn't like that because the king had bad taxes. So we developed the idea that government rules by the will of the governed. Well, that was new. That was new. And so, therefore, because the king hasn't governed us well, we have the right to rebel from him. But there were a lot of people that were loyalists uh, who went to Canada because um, they felt it was wrong because... The kings were established by God. We had no right to uh, reject them. And so the loyalists are there. Who were among them was my mother's family. My mother's uh, uh, family were one of the loyalists that came from the U.S. to Canada so that they could still be uh, in a place that 
uh, honors the now now the queen on that. So you know it's there's not black and white. It's not good and bad. You know it's better than worse. And uh, there's a country I'd want to live in, but by choice than us. I mean it's a blessing and um, that whole idea of freedom and yet um, law and restraint of that um, is good. So there's much much that is good. Um, that we have done, but we've always been a mix. Um, nations aren't saved or lost. Nations are just governments. It's people who are saved and lost. And thus, America was a Christian influenced nation. It was never a Christian nation um, in terms of that. So, anyways, we'll get to that a little bit later. So, I thought I'd want to bracket some of these questions in. So, let's go to Revelation 6 uh, and let's just start through. Uh, now, we're, he's got the scroll and now he's just opening the first seal. Um, as we looked at Jesus, uh, let's go back to make sure we understand again. Uh, I don't think it's harmful to be repetitive. But back in verse 6 of, of Revelation 5, um, saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So the lion is the lamb. He's the lion uh, and, and the lamb. But he had seven horns. Now, what are horns? King, ruler. Okay, uh, seven is the number of God, the number of perfection. Uh, so he has uh, the crowns. Uh, he is the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings. The crown there, the seven spirits is the better understood, the sevenfold spirit, the Holy Spirit, um, sent out to, uh, in all the earth. It was sent out by Jesus and the Father uh, there. So the seven spirits of God, uh, sevenfold spirit of God sent out uh, into all the earth. Um, so again, Symbols are always interpreted and always consistent. So we never have to use imagination. It's there. Now let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 6. Now what is, what is happening here, um, it isn't that suddenly it was, you know, Friday and then Saturday everything changed. As we're looking at these judgments of God, as we're looking at what's time is happening, we realize these are happening. What is changing when we get to Revelation 6 is the intensity of it. So he said in verse 1, now I watched um, 6, when, I, when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, so it's Jesus opening them, he's the only one who has the right, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come, and I looked, behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and its crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So the first was this one coming uh, to be the leader, the ruler of the world. Uh, so he's coming to conquer. Um, and we're going to see he's one of ten, uh, ten governments, ten nations. He takes over three, so there's seven rulers. He has three, and he becomes one uh, who uh, becomes the leader, and then at the middle of it declares himself to be God. Notice that um, as he comes with a white horse, um, its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. But notice he has a bow, but not arrows. So he's not conquering by force. Oh, he's, not, he's coming to conquer. That's his desire. He has that, uh, you know, the government's power with him. But he's not conquering by, by might. Uh, he's, he's conquering um, by, by what he's going to present himself as the one who's going to bring in the peace plan. Uh, so he's coming to conquer. Uh, he's coming to rule uh, and will put himself uh, in the place uh, of Jesus before the world. Uh, so that is happening. And as we look at the world, again, we keep looking at the tremendous vacuum there is uh, in world leadership. Um, uh, we are in crisis here. We're going to have hearings and all the rest of that, whether impeach or not. Um, Britain is trying to decide what they're going to do with their, they're in without government. Europe is in uh, turmoil. Um, um, South America, Chile, uh, Bolivia uh, is in uh, turmoil. Uh, Iran is, is having uh, riots. Uh, Iraq is having riots. Um, all wherever we look in the world, there is this unrest, uh, and there is no true leader. Uh, the only one who's doing 
uh, anything that seems to be in that will is Putin. But if you look what's happened in Russia, there's a lot of dissent there. Uh, so uh, that world is ripe uh, for this one who can come uh, and bring us peace, bring us together. Uh, the United States took a key step today uh, that was pretty profound uh, in terms of it, in which we declared it was no longer illegal for uh, Israel to be building in what's called the occupied territories. Uh, so these territories they've had since 1967 and the war that has destroyed them uh, has been this, they're occupied. Um, they, uh, so uh, they don't have the right to uh, inhabit it. So they have been building um, cities into what was the occupied area, particularly it's an issue around Jerusalem. Uh, and this whole idea of a two-state, of a Palestinian state and an Israeli state um, depended upon the boundaries. And now the United States has said, no, we, we fought this over, that's not illegal. Uh, they have the right to do this. Um, and it's gonna be interesting because Palestinians are, um, you know, are violently going to, uh, upset with this and uh, do not regard us anymore as a broker at all uh, in terms of ways to, um, bring peace in the, in, in the region. And we know it's not out of the United States this final plan comes. So uh, just one coming to conquer, but he does it not by power, uh, military power, uh, but by persuasion and by the conspiracy we've seen. We've saw a little bit, we'll see a little bit more uh, of the merchants, uh, global economy, uh, knowing wars uh, are bad for business. And so we need someone, and we, we know they've been working at um, taking away religious distinctives, and so there'll be a joining together in the New Peace Plan of Jew and, Catholic, or Jew and um, Christian and Muslim. Uh, that's there orchestrated, we think, by the Pope uh, in terms of that. But all of those will be in support of um, this person. We're going to get a little bit later. It appears to be someone where there's a group of former rulers who just say, we need to do this. We need to give this person this power. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. We see all of the uh, dynamic uh, is there. And the ability to control us, we're moving to a cashless society. Uh, you can see how, um, how it could get to the point where no one can buy or sell. Because if you're in a cashless society, uh, if it's all by code, uh, that um, we know the, the means is there to happen. Um, and um, so everything is there uh, in that vacuum, uh, in that place to there. So that's the first seal that's starting. Uh, and then he opened the second seal, verse 3. And I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so the people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Uh, so this is um, violence, civil unrest, um, um, nation against nation. Uh, and so there's uh, unleashing of violence uh, in the world. Uh, again, all Christians are gone, so there's no restraint anymore. Uh, in, in terms of this. And uh, so, you know, Satan's plan, uh, Satan hates us, and he loves us to destroy each other. Uh, just read in, what, at Walmart, where was that, in Oklahoma today? Or, where a guy came and his former wife with her boyfriend shot him to death, and then he was confronted and he shot himself to death. That is Satan. I mean, murder-suicide is his ultimate accomplishment. That's him. Uh, and we see that so rampantly today. That Saugus, um, um, 16 year old birthday uh, last week um, at Saugus High School. Um, why, why would you go with an attempt to kill and then to take your own life? Where does that come from? That's Satan um, who is murder suicide is his ultimate uh, victory. So war and, and violence is there. As we've seen, as I've said this week, uh, Iran is in uh, violence. They have put gas now costs 50% more than it did last week. 
and is rationed, and so people are taking to the streets, and blood's in the streets, and uh, Iraq is uh, in that same way. We know what's happening along the, on the Turkish border. So um, this violence uh, is, and this uh, is happening now. It, it increases uh, in, uh, in the seven-year period of time. Um, God lets us go and, um, and without restraint. And here's the evidence of that. Uh, and then we come to the, the third seal. So he's just going to order. Now we're in the seven-year period of time. These are all happening. Uh, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And his rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, uh, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So this is rampant inflation. Uh, so that a, a denarius is about a day's wages. So you're spending a day's wages for, um, you know, just a small portion uh, of wheat. Um, and so uh, economic chaos, disorder. Um, but notice it's not everywhere. Uh, as it says there in verse, um, at the end of verse 6, do not harm the oil and the wine. Well, that's, those are signs of luxury. Uh, so those are people who are living... Uh, in luxury, oil and wine are not necessities to life. Um, uh, they are that which um, people of wealth can have. So part of the world, uh, part of this time, great inflation. Uh, Venezuela um, is uh, unbelievable what's happened there uh, with their economy and, 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 and with food and so many other places um, where inflation is just um, beyond size and where people... Uh, work a day for hardly enough money to feed themselves for that day. Um, but this uh, goes on into more extreme uh, degrees around us. Uh, and then he, uh, verse 7, he opened the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, uh, a pale horse. Now this is the color of infection. It's the color of pus, okay? Um, so it's uh, a sign of disease. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And there, they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill, with sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. Um, so this is uh, that uh, one way is war now, uh, coming by disease, and by animals turning uh, against us. Remember when, when um, after the flood, everything changed and um, things became carnivorous. Uh, but God says in, in af after the flood that he put the fear of man into animals. Okay? So that they are naturally afraid of us. But he's going to take that away. Um, and, you know, Hitchcock imagined what would happen if all the birds were against us or you know, well, that's going to happen. Um, not exactly like Hitchcock, but maybe uh, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of that. You know, there uh, are uh, three cases of a bubonic plague in China this week. Uh, bubonic plague is the great plague that wiped out Europe, uh, that kills within a, a day, I think, or two days. Um, it's there. Uh, so, um, you know, Bill Gates, Microsoft, is deadly afraid that we're going to have some um, disease sweep through and kill millions of people, some pandemic, and we're not uh, ready for that. That's coming. Uh, that's there. Uh, death, remember death in Hades? Um, death is where people go uh, when they die without Christ. Hades is the temporary dwelling place. So they're now in the category of the dead. Their place uh, is Hades, uh, which is a temporary place of torment. It's not hell, uh, but they're being held for waiting for uh, the judgment day. But uh, again, it's like being in uh, L.A. prison, L.A. jail, waiting your trial. Uh, so they're there, they're in torment, uh, but they're not yet... Um, 
been resurrected for their judgment that's there. Uh, so death is, is this category where they are. Uh, we are in a category of eternal life. It uh, doesn't mean the end of their existence. Uh, it just means they are no longer among the living. Uh, and the place they are being held is in uh, Hades, uh, this temporary uh, place uh, that God has held them. So death is happening. You know, it's part of the, just, I was just talking uh, with the sister about her own family. It's part of what motivates us in sharing the gospel. We know this. These are our neighbors. These are people that we live with, work with. We know this. And without Christ, this is what's coming for them. Uh, so part of what um, God wants us to know this, because we're not in it. We're not in it. We're not having to figure out how to survive this. We're not in it. Um, but those we know will be. Uh, and therefore, God wants us to understand this so that we seize the moment, we redeem the time, we with passion um, reach people uh, that we can because we know this is coming uh, and this will be the reality uh, and, and what will happen. Sobering. Uh, when we come to the fifth seal, this is the seal of the martyrs. When you open the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge, you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer in a number of their until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves uh, had been. So, now these are not Christians. These are people who come to Christ during the seven-year period of time. Um, they aren't the 144,000 because they are sealed. No one can touch them. Uh, but they're people who have come to Christ, and now uh, they're being put to death for their faith in Christ because... This is the Antichrist, and uh, anyone who stands for Jesus is an enemy of the people, uh, has, um, should be put to death, uh, should be put away on uh, that. And, but notice that they are, uh, as, we, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, they are described under the altar. Um, so when we meet the church, um, it is before the altar. In Revelation 7, verse 9 and 5. We saw that. We'll get there, uh, Lord willing, next week. Uh, so they are under the altar. Uh, so they're not the church. The church is the bride of Christ. It's gone home. It's had its, um, our evaluation for reward or loss of reward. Um, and then the Mary Supper, all of that has happened this time. But these are those who come to Christ during the seven-year period of time, um, which they will pay a price for that. But it is only temporary. Uh, for eternally, they will have eternal life with Christ. Um, um, but it will be massive uh, in terms of uh, the number of killed and the governing authorities uh, are in, in support of this. Um, and of course, they're, they're crying out to the Lord, uh, how long? You notice they were put to death for, their, for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne uh, about Jesus. It was there. Not everyone will be killed. Uh, some will be put into prison, uh, but that last three and a half years, you won't be able to buy or sell. Uh, so they have the chance, and that's part of what my hope is, is that people we've witnessed here who get caught in this, or maybe are listening to this online, um, will come to Christ, and will realize what's happened, and why we're gone, and what's happened in the world, and uh, will come to Christ. They'll pay a price, but not eternal. Uh, only temporary uh, in this life. And so they're there under the throne uh, just crying out how long and, and God says, okay, just a little longer. Uh, and then they're not resurrected until the end of the seven years. We are already resurrected, uh, the church. But they don't get a resurrection body until uh, the end of the seven years. So they have uh, kind of a temporary dwelling place. They were given a white robe until rest a little longer. Uh, until the full number uh, has come. Then we come to um, this massive, massive, massive earthquake when he opened the six seals. Uh, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. 
And the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll which is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and the everyone, slave and free, and themselves hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand. So there's this massive earthquake uh, that shifts everything. Uh, I think when um, uh, Japan had its uh, 9.0, I think the whole earth moved 18 inches. Okay. Uh, so this uh, is, is massive uh, that's happening. And um, the sky is filled from the shaking of the dust uh, that's there, and so uh, the sun becomes black, uh, and the full moon became like blood because you're seeing it through the smoke, you're seeing it through the, the dust that has risen up. Uh, terrifying to imagine, and calling on the rocks to fall on them, uh, and the, the death will uh, elude them. Now, when Jesus was talking to the church, his great concern uh, for them during when he is coming back, is that they would be asleep. They would be asleep, um, as if life is there. Well, uh, so those who think the church is here for this, I would suggest no one's sleeping. No one's sleeping. Um, with everything moved and the sky turning black and blood red, and um, my, my son and daughter, we, the big earthquake, big bear landers earthquake, happened uh, when we were in Yucaipa, Calamesa, and Linda and I were in Colorado. <laughs> the only time we ever left them. Uh, he was, uh, I think John was a senior in high school and Jennifer was a junior, uh, when they had the mega earthquake when we were in Colorado. But John was out um, walking the dog when it hit, and he said the San Bernardino Mountains disappeared from this cloud of dust. Everything was shaken. Uh, during that, Jennifer watched as the TV fell to the floor. And I said, well, you watched? You watched it fall? <laughs> well, anyways. <laughs> there were many saving TVs in this time uh, that is there. And this is all during the first three and a half years. I mean, this is all uh, as it's just unhappening. The, the midpoint doesn't come till. Uh, the seventh seal is broken. So these are all things happening uh, with a quarter of the earth killed with uh, disease and violence and sword and beasts and famines and pestilences and, um, and then the martyrdoms that are there. But this is all happening in this first uh, three and a half periods of time. So whether the church is here or not is a critically important question if we take this to mean what it says. Um, of course, we understand uh, that's, this is the word of God, and it means what it says. And no one escapes, as it says over 15, kings and great ones and generals and rich and powerful and slaves and everyone. No one escapes. Um, and they hid in their caves and among the rocks and mountains. Now, Isaiah uh, talks about this uh, and describes this uh, as well uh, over in um, uh, Isaiah I got my wrong sheet here. Is it Isaiah 2 or 11? 11, I think. The end of chapter 11. Uh, this time when rocks are falling and people are wanting to die, but they can't. Um, this is the wrath of the Lamb. Um, what, what, what is happening is everyone's heart is being revealed. And the nakedness of people's rejection of Jesus is what qualifies this age. 
because this is the in place of Christ. He's blaspheming Jesus. He's um, blaspheming his name. He's blaspheming people that believe in him. Uh, and people's hearts are being revealed in their rebellion against uh, Jesus. And so that's, that's the character of these days. That's happening in our church now. God's revealing hearts. Uh, and temptations, seductions, threats, all the rest of that are all, this is a time when no one's going to be neutral. Everyone's going to have to resolve, do I stand for Christ and his word or not? So that's testing that. But this is the ultimate one now because their hearts have been revealed. Um, they've rejected Jesus. They've rejected the gospel. And now the wrath of God is coming upon them and upon the nations uh, for their rejection, for the rejection of him. And that's what qualifies this seven-year period uh, is the great day of the wrath uh, of God. So this is just the first three and a half years. Uh, now he comes uh, to what else is happening over in chapter 7, which is the gospel is being preached to Jewish people. Uh, and it says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, and no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Now, we're going to see these in the Revelation 11. This comes from the prophecy of the two prophets uh, who are witnessing of Jesus uh, in, in Jerusalem. And they have, uh, by God's order, said there, there will be no wind, there will be no rain for three and a half years, no weather systems, uh, because it's the moving of the, the wind that does that. Um, so it's three and a half year drought. All is there, and they know why. They know why. It's because of these prophets coming in the name of Jesus. And then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. And I heard the number of those sealed, 144,000 sealed, from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So the fullness doesn't happen until they're saved, and then God seals them, and they are protected from uh, any of these wrath that are coming, judgments that are coming uh, upon the rest of the world. Now, we see the list there, and uh, let's read it, because these are important. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, uh, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, uh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe uh, of Benjamin were sealed. Now, what's interesting about this is that since... Um, what, 800 years before Jesus was born, the 10 tribes of Israel have been lost. They were carried away by Assyria, uh, and there is, they were lost. Uh, the remaining were Judah and Benjamin, uh, which continued on until 585 years uh, before Christ was born when Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and took the rest of them away. Um, so, what happened to those? Uh, well, God hasn't lost track. They aren't lost to him. And uh, how he sorts that out and brings us about, that's just, he's just God. And they will be there uh, in Israel that, that are there um, from each of the tribes. Now, there's one tribe missing, uh, which we've uh, mentioned uh, before. Which one is it? Dan. Dan is missing, missing because it's the first one that introduced idolatry to Israel. Uh, Dan is far to uh, uh, the north, and so they were forever cursed because uh, of that. So they're not here. Uh, the two sons of Joseph uh, are used um, to make up uh, the 12, uh, replacing uh, Dan. Uh, so here they are. Now let's go just for a minute over to Revelation 11, and we'll just end with this uh, as to um, how this is, is happening. Uh, so they're in Jerusalem. Now what's happened now, remember all of this uh, is happening, is that there is a temple rebuilt. Okay? 
Uh, let's go over to Revelation 11. Let's see a little more detail. I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 uh, days clothed in sackcloth. So they're in Jerusalem, they're by the temple. Uh, so there is a rebuilt temple, but as again, as we, we said, notice that it said don't measure outside it, because it belongs to the Gentiles. Uh, so that somehow the temple is there, but the re remaining of the area of the mount, on the temple mount that's there, um, is, is Gentiles. And so uh, to me, um, I'm taking a little bit step beyond just what's said here, but assumptions I think must be uh, seem pretty evident to me. Uh, you know, right now in the Temple Mount is uh, the Dome of the Rock. Uh, also is uh, several other mosques and Muslim schools uh, are there, and then um, the rest of it is open. Uh, it's there. They don't let you. It's hard to get there anymore. We used to, we used to be able to do that. We used to go inside the Dome of the Rock, uh, but they don't let you do that anymore because of all of the. Uh, political sensitivities that are there. So to me, it's very possible for you to have a temple and the Dome of the Rock. You can have the Jews have their place, uh, the Muslims have theirs, Dome of the Rock, Christians have uh, um, theirs um, in, on um, Jerusalem on that mount uh, as well uh, that's there. Now, they could, they could do this in like a, three months. Uh, they already cut the stones. They've already built the altar. The altar is already in Jerusalem. Uh, they've already trained a priesthood. They've already prepared the garments. They've already prepared all of the uh, things that are used, um, the basins and all the rest for the temple. They're ready, uh, trained and uh, ready to do it, um, given that, that opportunity. Uh, what they need is the ark. Uh, and then uh, the um, mixture that comes from the ashes of the red heifer, um, uh, again, which because what makes the temple holy, what makes it holy is this mix of the blood of a red heifer, which is um, an anomaly in Israel. They aren't born red heifers, which means there's no hair on them but what's red. Um, in history, by Jewish tradition, there's been seven. The eighth one uh, will be the Messiah. They have tried to genetically breed them. Um, they, they don't get real open about this because this is such an incendiary issue uh, in the whole Muslim, Palestinian uh, issue that's there. Uh, there are many believe that they have the Ark. Um, there was a newscast maybe 20 years ago. We, they found it, and, and it was gone in a day. Because uh, you realize the significance of uh, having uh, the ark that's there. It is this temple that the Antichrist goes in to violate. Uh, when he goes in to have his image set up uh, in it, uh, that's there. So uh, these 144,000 we saw in Revelation 7, uh, are being witnessed to by these two witnesses. Uh, and it says in verse 4, these are two olive trees, two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. And they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, um, the beast rises from the bottomless pit, will make war on them, conquer and kill them. So they are there witnessing for three and a half years. Uh, and it's through their witness, not the church, it's through their witness that the 144,000 uh, come to salvation. Also that witness is, is going out throughout the earth as well because all the world's focused on these, on the Antichrist and these. Because these are the reason it's not raining. 
They are the only problem in the world because the Antichrist has brought peace with Israel and his neighbors and everything's good and the economy is great and all of us are getting along together except for those who quarter are being killed and all the rest of that. And you know, is these two who are there witnesses of Jesus. Now, who are they? Uh, there's a lot of speculation uh, that there, when Jesus was transfigured, uh, who appeared with him? Moses and Elijah, uh, the law and the prophets. Uh, so some people feel they uh, come back, uh, their ears. Uh, there is given to man once to die, and then comes the judgment. There are two men who have never died. Who are they? Enoch and Elijah. Uh, so there's speculation, well, there, it's them because they never died. Uh, and so they have come back, and then they were put to death. Um, I don't know. I don't know how anyone would know um, who, who, exactly who they are. I don't know if God's taken volunteers. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't mind doing it. <laughs> um, volunteers, but um, uh, they will come. They're not the church, uh, although they are witnesses of Jesus, and they are bringing that witness to uh, the 144,000. Uh, and they, 144,000, represent Israel on earth. So that when Jesus comes back to earth, he is received as the king of Israel by the nation of Israel, which are these 144,000. Because all the rest are compromised. All the rest have signed on with the Antichrist. All the rest have taken uh, his sign uh, upon them. So these 144,000 will represent Israel. Uh, and the last wave uh, of salvation that God is going to uh, do. Um, and they have miraculous powers. It's, it's what Moses did. You know, he could uh, turn water to blood. He could cause it um, to be dark. He could cause the world to be flooded with uh, grasshoppers or flies. Um, you know, each of the ten plagues of Moses were against one of the gods. Each one. Um, and you know who, the, who, uh, who they thought the ultimate God was? The Lord of the Flies. Because whoever the Lord of the Flies, there are so many of them. He must be a powerful God. So you see the madness <laughs> uh, that, that people have. Uh, we'll get back to this uh, next week, Lord willing, uh, because it ends with them being killed, world throwing a party, and they won't let them be buried. So they're on the internet three and a half, three and a half days, and then uh, Jesus resurrects them, and we'll trace the 144,000 that are there. So we're planning to meet next week, uh, and then we're not meeting in December, and then we'll come back, uh, Lord willing, uh, for the first three Mondays in January. All right, have a blessed Thanksgiving. No, I'm going to see you before that. Well, still have a blessed Thanksgiving, but I'll get to do that personally next week. You've been great. Well, let me pray. Father, again, thank you for you. You, you want us to know, um, to know the certainty of our hope that those who stand in the blood of Jesus, um, he has conquered for them. They are saved. They are complete. They have a righteousness that isn't from them. It's from him. But they didn't create themselves. We are your creation. But Lord, also as we go back into this world, as we see the four horsemen are riding, it just isn't the fulfillment of the intensity of it. Lord, that you would give us a chance to share Jesus. You would give us a chance to be or bring a reason for the hope that we have. That we would give an opportunity even to say, you know, you know what I'm doing on Monday nights? We're talking about Revelation and, you know, I'm learning. And Lord, will you use that opportunity? Will you bless each one? Will you give us restful nights and um, a day, uh, a rest of the week to walk with you and to bring glory to you, great joy and worship this weekend. We love you. And we are committed to you no matter what. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.